morning. I'm glad that you are with us today. We are, um, we are in the middle of a series in 1 Thessalonians. And so if you are joining us, we are on about the 4th or 5th week. And as you open to 1 Thessalonians, you'll find that it is, it is not a very long book. And so you may think, well, how can you spend four or five weeks there? Well, we'll we're about halfway finished with it. But we are in 1 Thessalonians today. And we started out several weeks ago, and we talked about the ideal church. Now, I didn't say the perfect church, the ideal church, because uh, we all know that there is no perfect church. The church at Bethel and Eichel is not a perfect church. New Old Baptist Church is not a perfect church. And if it were the perfect church, I, I can tell you it's not the perfect church because I'm here. And so that's how I always know that I'm not in a perfect church, because I'm, I'm in it. But, um, and so maybe the rest of you are, but anyway. But we, we can see in, in, in Thessalonica, the church there, some good qualities. And there are some things that we can learn from them. And also there are some things um, that we can learn from their mistakes. And so we're seeing that as well. And from the, from the ideal church, we have moved on to the ideal servant. And we looked at Paul as that great example of service and how he was so willing to give of himself in all things in his life. And, and, and he even says um, at one point in the scripture that he would gladly give up his own life if it meant that his brothers could come to Christ. And then from there we moved on to discipleship. And we spent a week talking about ideal discipleship. And we had, we had spent a lot of time in discipleship several uh, months before. In fact, we spent a couple months talking just about discipleship. And discipleship truly is... Uh, Josh, would you like to shut the door for me? A discipleship is one of those things, one of those keys to doing church that I think we have so far to go on. You know, we talked about you and discipleship and how God is calling us to come alongside those who are not as mature in their, in their walk with Christ as we are. And that's not to say that any of us have reached a point. But if you have been saved for one year, then you should be further along in your walk as a believer than someone who's been saved for six months. And hopefully you have something you can share with them. And I, we talked that week about how important it is for us to come alongside new believers. And I even challenged you that week. I, I said, you know what? There are the believers in here who have been believers for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years or more. Some of you have, can, can say that you've been a believer. And I challenged you. I said, come alongside one of our youth or come alongside one of our children. We have... Three or four children who we've baptized in the last six or eight months or a year. We have three or four youth that we've baptized within the last year. And I challenge you, I say, come alongside one of them and, and, and help to disciple them. Help them to learn about the foundations of their faith. And I even showed you some materials. Like this survival kit or like this, I'm a Christian now. Because some of you say, well, I just don't know how to do that. I don't know how to disciple someone. Well, these are great resources. You don't have to go into it blindly. You don't have to do it all on your own because we have resources like that. But I have to say that after that challenge, I've not had, to my knowledge, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe someone has come alongside one of our youth or one of our children. But no one's asked me for those resources. And church, I challenge you, we've got to do this. If we're really serious about making sure that the generations that follow us have a foundation in the faith and they know why they believe what they say they believe, then we have to help them to discover that. In church, so often we want to say, well, that's going to happen in Sunday school. We have great Sunday school teachers, but they have anywhere from two or three or four in class to, to ten or twelve in class. And we have great people who are working with our children and our youth on Wednesday nights. But they, again, they have anywhere from two or three or four or five to 15 or 20. Church, I can tell you that as when our children, and especially when our youth, when they start slipping away and we start to say, well, I wonder where so-and-so is at. I wonder where she's at. Or I wonder where he's at now. We haven't seen him in several weeks. Church, we can't blame, you can't blame that on the pastor. You can't blame that on their Sunday school teacher. You can't blame that on their Wednesday night teacher. It's up to you. You have a responsibility in coming alongside these new believers. So how do I do that? Well, ladies, maybe you want to call, pick one of these girls and say, Hey, what are you doing next Saturday morning? Come over and help me make some cookies for the hayride. 
And while those cookies are baking, you take some resources or you sit down with them and you share with them about your faith. And you build a relationship with them. Guys, maybe you want to pick one of them up and take them fishing. But building a relationship, it's not a one-time encounter. It's a commitment. And it can be dirty. It can be messy. Because sometimes these new believers, they don't know anything. But it's what we're called to do. Discipleship is so important. And it's a step that we're skipping. We're leaving out an important facet of that. And then last week we went on and we started talking about a walk. The ideal walk. And I said there are some characteristics of walking. First of all, you've got to be alive. You've got to be growing. You've got to be progressing. And we talked about that. And eventually we got to the last part where I, we begin to talk about the type of walk that God is calling us to. And we were there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And in those first ver- eight verses we were actually talking about walking in holiness. And Paul was specifically talking about a life of sexual purity. And I'll tell you, that was a tough lesson. And, and I had several of you mentioned last week, oh, that was good, Pastor. I'm glad you did that. But, and some of you even said the youth need to hear that. But church, that's not just for our youth. That's not just for our youth. Sexual sin can destroy a church. I can tell you, I've been in a church where it's happened. It can destroy a church. Yes, it's important for our, our youth and our children to know that fornication is not okay. But it's not okay for adults, and neither is adultery. And we have to be very careful. Well, today we're going to be continuing that. And, and like I said, last week we were talking about a walk of holiness. Well, this week we're going to continue that, and we're going to be talking about a walk of love. And a walk, about a walk of honesty. And so this morning we're going to still be in... 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're just going to continue on with the next few verses there. And when we were talking about a walk of holiness, really that walk specifically affects the family. Because when we're talking about sexual sin, that can certainly destroy a church depending on whose sexual sin it is. And fortunately, in the case I mentioned, it was the sexual sin of a pastor. And I'll tell you, it happened eight years ago. And that church today is still suffering from the effects of that. But I'll tell you, it, it may not, if it's, if it's the sexual sin of a member of the body, it will have an effect, but it may not have as traumatic effect. But I tell you, I can tell you exactly where it will have devastating effects, and that's in the home. Because it always has, it always has traumatic effects in the home. Well, today as we talk about a walk of holiness, we're going to talk about that in relation to the church. And as we talk about a walk of honesty, we're going to talk about that in our everyday walk outside of the church and even in our own in our jobs. So I've asked you this morning to open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I want you to look with me at verses 9 and 10 as we get started this morning. It says in verse 9, about brotherly love. You don't need to me, you don't need me to write you because you yourselves are taught. By God to love one another. In fact, you are doing this toward all of your brothers in the entire region of Macedonia. But we encourage you, brothers, to do so even more. Let's pray. Dear Father, as we open your word this morning, I I ask that you would speak to my heart first and foremost. That I would have clarity this morning as I try to... As I try to present the message that you've given to me, Father, I I ask that you would speak directly to my heart. And as we are opening your word, that you would speak to the hearts and to the minds of each of those who are sitting here today, regardless of age. (coughs) That, Father, you would just reveal that nugget of truth, that kernel of life that you want us to apply to our own walks tomorrow. Father, I just ask this in your name. Amen. So as we see here, starting in verse 9, Paul, he's, he's talking to the in his letter to the church at Thessalonica, and he's, he's saying to them, I don't have to talk to you a lot about this, because this is something that you are doing okay at. You're already doing it. You know what God says about brotherly love. He was exhorting them in this, because they were a church that was known for, uh, for this particular thing. For brotherly love. Now, I do have, this morning, I, I hope that you have your notebooks with you. And, you know, last week I, I put a thank you note in the bulletin. I, I so appreciate
appreciate, my family so appreciates uh, your generosity to us, and, and this month, I, I, it's Pastor Appreciation Month, and, and your gift last week was, was so generous to us, and we appreciate that. But I said this last week, and one of the things that encourages me more than anything, and Brent, hold your notebook up. I tell you what, is more than the gift that you gave me, that is an encouragement to me. I know there are others, I know Miss Jeannie, I see her taking notes, and I see several of you, but I tell you, that is such an encouragement to me. Because what? Because this is not just for me, it's for you. And how can you take this and distribute it to those around you? If you're like me, you can't remember a lot of what went on yesterday. And so taking notes allows you to, to be able to remember, and especially this week, because we're going to be looking at a lot of Scripture this week, and if you don't have something to write it down on, you're going to miss some of it. And so I would encourage you to get your bullets now, or, or get something so that you can write some Scripture down and refer back to it. But the first scripture I want us to look at is in 1 John, in chapter 3, in verse 14. It says, We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So brotherly love is so important. We see that throughout the scripture, the proof that you are saved is in how you love your fellow Christians. That's the proof. You can tell a lot about a person by the type of company that they keep. You know, it always, it always baffles me how someone can say, well, I'm growing, I have a, I'm saved. I, I read my Bible, I'm growing in my relationship with Christ. And you ask them, well, do you go to church anywhere? No, I can watch it on TV. Church, it's hard. To, I, I just don't see how you can do that. Developing relationship with like-minded believers is such an important part of your, developing and growing your relationship with Christ. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't have relationships with people who are not believers, and we absolutely should. Probably we should have more of them. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, that's, that's something that's difficult for some of us to do, including myself. Here I am Sunday morning, and almost, most of you would claim to be believers. When I go to school tomorrow, now there's a lot of students who are, who are as lost as gooses, but every single person that I sit in the lounge with has a professing relationship with Jesus Christ. It can be difficult to form relationships with people who aren't believers, but it's important that we do have relationships with believers. It's so important. It's important to walk in love. They should know you by the way you walk, by those you love. In 1 Peter, another scripture I want us to look at. In 1 Peter, that's, uh, just flip to your right just a little bit. 1 Peter chapter 1. And in verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22 says, By obedience to the truth, having purified yourself for service, I'm sorry, uh, by obedience to the truth, having purified yourself for sincere love of the brothers, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. On over to First John again. First, First John chapter four, verses eleven and verse twelve it says, "Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we must also love one another." No one has ever seen God, and if we love one another, God remains in us, and His love is perfected in us. Love is so important. You don't have to read very many pages in Scripture before you see this theme of love that glares through. And so this walk of love is so important. Because you know what? The world will look at us as Christians, and they see so much of what we believe and so much of how we uh, how, how we behave, and they, they kind of look at that as foolishness. When we preach sin, the world looks at us and says, well, that's you're just being narrow-minded. You're being old-fashioned. When we preach prophecy, people will say, well, you're just a dreamer. When we preach separation, the world says, ah, you're just being fanatical. When we preach tithing, the world will look at us and say, oh, that's just a, a money-hungry 
preacher or that's just a money hungry church. But there is one coin that is always taken at face value. One quality that is undeniable. It is unmistakable. And that quality is brotherly love. They will know you as Christians by your love. There is one, one thing. Now, love is one reason that fighting within the church is so damaging. You know, fighting in the church can literally destroy the church. Battling egos within a church are more paralyzing to the church than the most outspoken atheist in the community. Battling egos in the church are far more devastating than the, than the, the most paralyzing, uh, the, than the great, biggest drug dealers or the biggest alcoholics. Egos in the church are more devastating than anything that the world can throw at us. Personal agendas in the church literally destroy the body. We must check our egos at the door when we come in. It cannot be about our personal agendas. Otherwise, the world will look at us and they'll say there's no difference than those people in New Hope Baptist Church and there is around the world around us. They're all about getting what they want. And that becomes then a viable excuse that they can have for not believing. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll give you just a moment to get there. First Corinthians chapter 3, and then down in verse 3 it says, Because you are still fleshly, since there is envy and strife among you, you are you are not flesh, are you not fleshly and living like ordinary people? When we when the church acts just like the world, then we cease to be a church. A true church is built on the bricks of brotherly love. You may ask yourself, well, how do I know? Well, think about it. Are, are these things that might be used to, to describe you and your dealings with the congregation? Would people say that you cause discord? Or could you describe yourself or would others describe you as being jealous or selfish or envious? Or easy to anger. Or that you quarrel. You know, sometimes we like to just make excuses for these things. And we like to say, oh, so-and-so can't help it. That's just the way they are. Their mom or their dad was like that. They can't help that. That's just the way they are. Church, you know what? The, we may try to call them personality traits. But the Bible is not that charitable. The Bible calls these things sin. And we have to be very, very, very careful. In Galatians... Chapter 5, verse 19 and through 21, it has this to say. Now the works of the now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, fractions. Envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar about which I tell you in advance, as I told you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Church, we cannot allow these things to happen because they will destroy our church. And what this allows us to do, when we focus on this, then it takes our focus off the world. And when we allow that to happen, stay is having victory in our church. Because we're not able to focus on the world around us because we're more focused on making sure that things happen the way I want them to. Making sure that things happen the way that we've always done them. Making sure that things happen the way we're comfortable doing it. Church, if the way we're doing it was working, this church would be filled to capacity today. But it's not. We have to be willing to let go of our egos. We have to be willing to let go of our own will. The birthmark of a Christian is brotherly love. 
Brotherly love is a love that puts others above yourself. That's hard for us to do. You know, sometimes we can put our kids above us. We might be able to put our spouse above us. Maybe you can put your best friends above you sometimes. But when it comes to just church acquaintances and church friends, you know what we talked We talked about church friends a few weeks ago. Those are the people that you shake hands with on Sunday morning, but you really don't think about them too much until you see them the next week. Until we're willing to put them above ourselves. That's brotherly love. Being willing to put others first. See, God is a God of restraint. He's not a God of vengeance. It's not my job to get even or to teach somebody a lesson. The graduate level of Christianity teaches us to bless those who curse us, to love those who hate us, to pray for those who would use us, to do good to those who do evil to us. I would challenge you to do this. I would challenge you to think about your own prayer list, to think about your own prayer list, those things that you pray for on a daily basis. I would, I would ask you this, because this is something I have to do for myself. And this has changed my prayer life in a lot of ways. If you were to look at my prayer list today, some of those people that cause me the most strife are at the top of my prayer list. I don't neglect to pray for them. I pray for them first. Church, that's what we have to be about. You have to be praying for those that you don't get along with, for those that you can't seem to, to uh, see eye to eye to. Those that make you mad. Those that make fun of your kids. Those that mistreat you. Those are the ones that we have to pray for. Because guess what? God has to change something. He's either got to change them, or He's got to change you, or you're not ever going to reach them for Christ. God is not a God of vengeance. Some of you, this picture that's up here, and I, I, I apologize, I know this is hard to see. We've got to do something about the screen or the... the, the being able to see that. I've had some great comments from some of you that you appreciate this, but I know it's hard to see. But the picture there is an illustration of Joseph. And if you remember Joseph's story, man, if anyone had the right to seek vengeance, it was Joseph. I mean, at the end of Joseph's story in the Scripture, we see his brothers bowing at his feet, pleading with him for life and food. They didn't have a clue who he was. But I believe that when he, they entered the door, he knew exactly who they were. And he could have said, when and no one would have questioned, he could have said, slice their heads off and throw them to the birds. And, and the people would have done it without question. They didn't know who he was. But when he saw them, I'm sure those things went through his mind. The beatings that they, the tauntings that they gave him. The time when they beat him up and they threw him in that hole. I'm sure he was thinking about the time when they sold him into slavery. I'm sure that when he saw his brothers, he began to think about those years he was a slave. And those years he, he spent in prison. Sure, his life at that point was a good life in the, in the world's eyes. But he'd come from a rough past. And when he looked at his brothers, if anyone had the right to be vengeful, it was Joseph. But that wasn't his goal. He showed restraint. He showed restraint. He showed the love of God. God is not a God of restraint. It's not about making sure that we get our will and making sure that we get even with people. That's what we see in Scripture. That's what we see in this great example in Joseph. We need to be willing to, to yield our own, our own self and our own desires to make sure that the best is done. We need to seek God's best. Also, God is not a, a God of, of selfishness. He's a God of deference. You know, I'm convinced that a lot of times we get ourselves into trouble. Or at least I can't speak for you, I can speak for myself. A lot of the times when I get myself into trouble, at least half the time, it's because I have to have my will, my way. And the other half of the time, it's because I got my way. It may take that a minute to sink, to, to sink in. Half the time I get in trouble because I have to have my will. The other half, it's because I got it. God is not a God of selfishness. He's a God of... of, of uh, Deference. 
So many of us want to live our lives cafeteria style. I'm going to have that, but I'm not going to have that. I'm going to have that. I'm going to have it my way. There's a little boy and his sister who were struggling to both ride on a rocking horse. And the older brother looked up at the mom and said, You know what? There would be a lot more room on this horse for me if one of us would get up. You know, that's so often the way we want to look at things. Some Christians are only content when they're getting their way. This is another illustration here. And, and again, this is Abraham and Lot. You know, Abraham took in, Abraham took in Lot and his family grew and flourished and they grew together, but it reached a point that they had to go their own separate ways. And one would have thought that Lot would have looked at what Abraham had done for him and he would say, oh, Abraham, you take that fertile plain and I'll take my family and we'll go over here and we'll figure something out. But no, that's not what Lot did. Lot was thinking about his number one, not God, me. And he said, give me that fertile land. And Abraham should have said but no, that's not what he did. He said, okay. And he took him, his family and they went to the land that would seem to be less desirable. And we know that God blessed them. Harmony flourishes in the church where each prefers the other's will over their own. Just a couple more scriptures I want us to look at this morning in Romans. Romans chapter 5. Sorry, Romans chapter 12. Verse 10. Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says this. Do not lack diligence. Be fervent. Do not lack diligence. Be fervent in the Spirit. Serve the Lord. I'm sorry, I'm off on the wrong truth. Show family. There we go. Show family affection to one another with brotherly love. Notice what it says. This is the Holman Standard Version. But it says, outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another in showing honor. That's what Abraham did. He could have taken what probably was rightfully his, but he was not about that. One more scripture here in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. It says, now, finally... All of you should be like-minded and sympathetic, should love believers and be compassionate and humble. We are called to love one another. We are called to, be, to express brotherly love. That's hard for us to do. To express that love that puts someone else above ourselves. That's hard for us to do, church, I realize. That's what God is calling us to. Now as I'm looking at my notes, I have made it about halfway through, so I'm actually going to stop here. We're going to finish this tonight. So I would ask you tonight, I would encourage you to come back, because tonight we're going to continue this, and we're going to talk about a, a walk of honesty, because that's so important. Because as we walk out in this world, as we go outside these doors, there are people who are looking at you. And they want to know, is that person going to be different? Is that person going to be different in the way they deal with others? Is that person going to act different in business? Or are they going to act just like everyone else? There is a world that's watching. God is calling us to a walk that will draw us closer to Him. He's calling us to a walk of holiness. One that of purity. And as we saw this morning, God is calling us to a walk where we of brotherly love, where we put others above ourselves. As challenging as that is, it's what God is calling us to. Let's stand this morning. And the invitation is this. As we went through that list of characteristics, I want you to think about your own self. Don't think about anyone else, because it's easy for us to judge someone else, isn't it? It's easy for us to say, well, I hope so-and-so was listening to what Pastor Heath was saying. I wasn't talking to them. I was talking to you. Could you be accused of being selfish? Could you be accused of, make, of wanting your own will? Or... That's what I want you to think about this morning. And if God has spoken to you, maybe you want to do business right there where you're at, but maybe you want to bite pride and just walk in down here to this altar and do business with God here.
Maybe God is calling you to something else. Maybe God has spoken to you about your relationship with Him. Maybe you've realized this morning that you don't have a personal relationship with Him. Maybe today is your day of salvation. If that's you, I would love for you to come. I'd love to share with you how you can find Christ as your personal Lord and Savior.